in that common, only one in three projects uses a variable, and the use of many variables is very rare. Only 7% uses more than four. Procedures aren't common either. Only 8% of projects use a procedure. And what's very interesting for the people from the software engineering community is that 62% of the procedures is only invoked once. So we can't really say that kids do reuse. There's definitely an opportunity here for some learning, learning materials into teaching kids reuse. So most programs are really small and simple, but we found some interesting examples. Here, for example, is a recreation of Minecraft created in Scratch with 300 variables, 300 procedures, and over 100 events. So those things are, are really quite big. And the final thing we explored is the idea of code smells. These are behaviors in source code that aren't necessarily a bug, but they're just not well structured. For example, duplication. Here you see an example of the same block of code repeated twice, where you could have created a procedure, or you could have grouped things together using a signal, for example. And this was, was quite common. We found that 26% of the projects has duplication uh, between sprites, and within sprites, 10%. Large scripts were common as well. If you count the number of projects with scripts over 18 blocks, this happens in 30% of the projects. So even though many are small, most there are some projects that use really big blocks. The final code smell we looked at is dead code. So that's code in a project that's never invoked if you click the green flag, um, which is we know from professional developers often equated with bugs because it confuses your understanding of the program. That code is quite common, especially blocks like this that don't have a trigger or triggers without stacks. They're relatively common in a quarter of the projects and you see that signals that never are broadcasted or procedures that are never invoked are not that common, but those Concepts also aren't that common. And in total, we found that 28% of the projects have some dead code. And again, we know from professional developers that this can lead to misunderstanding because it's hard for children to understand what is and what isn't executed, especially in those two cases where you think, oh, this will happen when I broadcast a signal, but the signal isn't broadcast anywhere. So in summary, most programs are simple, but Code smells are relatively common, and to close my session, one of the things we're focusing on now, of course you wanna know, okay, kids sometimes write bad code, what do we do? Well, we designed an online course in which we explain kids not only about programming concepts and games, but also about code smells, where we hope that some of these patterns can be diminished in the future by educating kids about them. That's it. I'm Felina. I'm on Twitter as well. So if you like this talk, send a tweet about it. And also, I have a workshop at three about programming and storytelling, especially in the context of comic books. So thank you very much. And just we'll welcome our next speaker, uh, Michael. Uh, there's one. Yes. Um. Okay. Yeah, I think it does. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm Michael, and uh, I'm 160 centimeters tall. And since I'm 28, uh, I know I can do anything about my eight. So m maybe I can fake my eight, so wearing elevator shoes, um, or um, just lie about my eight. In fact, I'm 157. <laughs> but, uh, but I know that uh, uh, if I go to the gym, I can become thinner, I can become in better shape. So my eight or my eye color is a fixed trait. I can do anything about it. But uh, my muscles can grow. But what about intelligence? How many of you think that intelligence can deeply, truly grow in a person? OK, so maybe this talk is not for you, because you are quite convinced. But <laughs> I work with um, 
primary teachers, I work on teacher training, and uh, a lot of them have, have a fixed mindset. So their uh, aim is to appear intelligent. They don't ask questions to not seem stupid. They avoid challenges and things uh, that, sh that they don't know. Uh, they envy others' success because they're intelligent and uh, you're not. Uh, they don't value effort. Uh, they ignore critics or get angry. They focus on results, so they want to be the best. Uh, other teachers and other students have a growth mindset, so their aim is to learn. They ask questions, they accept challenges to learn, to improve. They do things that they don't know how to do yet. They are inspired by other success because they want to be like them. Uh, they value effort because they know with effort you can improve. And they try to learn from critics. And so in general they focus on learning, being better. As Ada Lovelace uh, said, she wants to be good, not to be thought as good. So Ada Lovelace is uh, uh, the growth mindset. Uh, Growth mindset is important because it can predict uh, student results, especially in math and science, and can protect girls from stereotypes about women in math. So in contexts where there are stereotypes about women in math, women with a growth mindset mm, go on uh, even if there are these stereotypes. So the question is, can we develop growth mindset? Yes, uh, we can teach mindset and brain plasticity. And Eloisa will talk about brain plasticity in the next talk. Uh, you, we can value challenges, efforts, mistakes as good. We can praise process, so say, you did a great job, you had an hard work, uh, rather than saying you're smart, you're intelligent. But, of course, there can be different mindsets for different subjects. and. Uh, you can't teach growth mindset if you don't have a growth mindset. It's not just saying, try out, you can do it. You have to truly believe it. And of course, if you push students to put effort in a traditional transmissive education system, it is fruitless, useless, I think. Uh, moreover, computer science uh, can induce fixed mindset. So that's the idea of the gig-gin. And in fact, um, we test, and after a CS1 course, uh, people had more fixed ideas about intelligence than they had before. <laughs> so we, we have a problem. Uh, but I think that creative learning and scratch with uh, some of its characteristics can help. And of course, paper already wrote it in Mindstorm, so nothing new, but I tested it. So uh, I did the creative computing and computational thinking with scratch course. Uh, inspired by Carmelo, by the way, and uh, on primary female master student or pre-service teacher, if you if you want. Uh, so at the beginning of the course, they told me, "No, I'm not a CS person. I'm not able to use computer. Um, I can I never can learn to program." At the end of the course, they had an increased growth mindset. So they thought that intelligence could grow, can grow, and a decreased computer science anxiety. So these are, of course, preliminary results, but I think uh, it's a way to go. So thank you. session. Um. <laughs> yeah, five minutes now. <laughs> hello. Yes, hello. So maybe I gain a little bit of time while you're searching my presentation. <laughs> no cheating. You can start. I don't know if I get along with two things in my hand. So, hello everybody, I'm Christiane Bauer. I'm a manager at SAP, and I would like to share some insights with you, what we do with SNAP and our great colleague Jens um, at SAP. Who of you knows SAP? Uh, okay, for those who don't know SAP, I will share a little bit, one slide only, about what is SAP at the end of the presentation. 
Let me start with a recent event we did last Friday at SAP. Um, I need to change that. We had our first Go Digital Night at SAP. And you can see Jens in action, who gave an intro into uh, Snap. You can see we had plenty of people with us. And on the right, this is a warm-up game. This is from Design Thinking. I'm a Design Thinking coach as well. And we like to combine the attitude, the mindset of Design Thinking with coding. Both share that they are very creative and that we love to build on the ideas of each other. So we had 180 participants. The age range, because we love to work in diverse team, was between 8 and 48, um, which is it. We had 45 schools attracted um, around our, our headquarter. And what we do in the SAP Young Thinkers program, which is a program I will tell you about in a minute, we acquire colleagues to become SAP school ambassadors, young thinker ambassadors, and 30 of them helped us uh, to organize and to do the event. Um, we had different workshops. So Jan started with an intro session, then we had gaming with Snap. We had artificial art with Snap, inspired by uh, Joachim Wiedekind, who is sitting here in the back. Um, and we had 3D modeling with Beetle Blocks and did jewelry. The workshop was mainly visited um, by girls. Um, and the whole event, we had 50% girls, women. Um, and as well, we had a maker space and a chill out area. So we had like guided learning in the workshops, and we had unstructured, self driven learning in a coat and chill area. What was nice to see was we had two workshop rounds that in the first round, many people joined the workshops and expected guidance. And in the second round, they felt confident already. After only one hour of instruction, they felt confident. They teamed up. They sat together. They exchanged and built their own project sitting in the makerspace. Some more impressions. And you can see beautiful projects were done in nothing of time. Very focused, very concentrated, with a lot of fun. Adults, young people, working together, learning together, sharing, learning from each other. I like the term, um, how to say it in English? Reverse mentoring. So in this topic, young people teach older people. It's not a matter of age. It's a matter of interest and motivation and creativity. The feedback was overwhelming. And this was a spontaneous idea that we asked, who would like to share a project? You don't need to, but you can. And this little girl, eight years old, she stood up, the other one as well, and they said, we want to share. We want to share what we learned. And very, very confident, nearly 200 people in the room. They were on stage, and they reported what they did, and they were so excited. And we asked, would you like to come back? What do, you, uh, do you like Snap? And 99% were, yes, yes, want to do it again. Um, we are, is another topic, like coding is one thing, but there is more in the age of digitalization. There is sensor work, there is Internet of Things, there is design thinking, this is soft skill, this is attitude, this is mindset. Different mindset, not mindset of competition, mindset of sharing. Sharing and building on the ideas of each other. This is UI design. This is analytics. How do I derive information from data? All this is what we cover with our SAP Young Thinkers 
program. These are the topics we focus on. And tomorrow there will be a workshop led by Jens and Jatka about smart gardening. Smart gardening is a module with SNAP. SNAP is a bridge to SAP software. The software which is used by hundreds of thousands of customers in the world we start like easy. Eight-year-old children can start to code. We use the sensors. We collect the data of plants like temperature, humidity, and so on. And the data is then analyzed. And you can derive information. And you can send an email when your plant is thirsty, and so on and so forth. More details tomorrow in the workshop. We more impressions on other things we do, like business processes, for sure, business modeling. You can do business modeling canvas with 10-year-old children. This is amazing. I'm impressed every time I work with children um, about their capabilities. Unbelievable. So the program really three pillars. I'm done. Oh, cut off. Um, <laughs> I just leave the slide for you. Ah, I get um, 10 more seconds. SAP, for those who didn't know it, a big company um, focusing on enterprise software. We have 350,000 customers around the world, big, big brands. We have 85,000 employees around the globe who are experienced in these topics and who would like to share their knowledge with the world. Let me stop by having said this. Hi everyone, I'm Eloisa Salzberg. I'm from Brazil and I'm happy for being here in the 10th anniversary of Scrat. And I'd like to tell you that I'm a biologist and I have spent many years in uh, psychology and specialized in neurology. And I have been working for more than 10 years uh, helping students to overcome their problems, any kind of problems at school. And we have many success, so I saw that I was in the right way. Uh, I developed this method based on my background in neurology and everything I have studied before. And I focus on motivation for learning. And I use this cutting edge knowledge, uh, including neuro new concept uh, about how the brains can change by learning. And I will have a, a workshop tomorrow that we can explain this a little bit more. And then I've trained almost 10 years working with these and getting these good results. Uh, in 2013, 2013, I participated in the learning, creative learning, and I knew uh, about a scratch. And I had this idea and based on my background, that we could use Scratch also as a powerful tool to help children to overcome their difficulties. Uh, let me give you an example. This is Lorena. She's, she was five years old here, and she had a problem. The school had 
called mother and said, oh, she's the only one that uh, is not literate. She can't read, she can't write, she must have some kind of problem. Then I met her and I saw that after one year at school, she couldn't know how to join letters to make syllables after one year at school. And then, among other uh, strategies, I decided to make a specific project uh, according to their interests, age, and needs. This first project uh, is about letters that come dancing, and it's an interactive program. So the importance of interactivity. And she could choose the letters, consonants and vowels, make the syllables, and then she start saying that aloud. And I record it and put back in the project. So <laughs> she had all the interactivity and interesting. She, you can see here that at the same time, this child was learning how to join letters to make words. She was uh, seeing how to join blocks to make a coat. <laughs> it was very interesting. It was the very first case that I saw that someone had learning uh, the both things together. She was very, very engaged and learning very fast. So I decided to make another now for making words in this, with the same ideas. At this point, she knew that I could put more blocks and more things. And sometimes I made mistakes because I had to deal with everything <laughs> I made mistakes. And then she said, oh, it's a book. So it comes naturally that we can make mistakes and we can be fixed and learning, it keep on learning. Uh, so here he's already typing in the prompt. The uh, uh, Pico asks for, so it's interactive. She reads, she listens, and she types, she learns. She learns. Uh, at the second grade, now she passed the year. After one month, she learned how to read and write. Uh, so, uh, my conclusion is that we, we can, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and my conclusion is that we can use Scratch also as a powerful, uh, powerful tool to help children to overcome their needs and overcome difficult uh, topics in the, across the curriculum. So I'd like to thank you very much for Natalie. I'm so sorry that she's not here. Uh, me to Resnick for all his inspiration uh, and courage. Us. And I also like to thank you for all peers and friends for all parts of the world that I have the chance of meet. Uh, I was touched, sorry. Uh, personally, uh, vitally, in many parts of the world, and having so much play, sharing passions and projects in this worldwide, lifelong kindergarten. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time for our uh, last speaker of today's session. More Ignite Talks at 3. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Serge. I come from a small French company uh, called Tralaler. We create uh, digital education resources. And we work on, a, on something called Code Decode, uh, in which we try to give kids 
uh, tools for understanding the digital world through creation. And so w when we started, we asked ourselves a bunch of questions. So what is it to learn code? You know, is it a language? Is it a logic? Is it something else? Uh, computational thinking. Uh, is learning code enough to try and help build uh, the future digital citizens? Or do we need something else, other tools? And if we provide other tools, should we just let kids run with it and, and explore by themselves, you know, try and error, uh, empirical method? Or maybe should we try and guide them and help them navigate all the, uh, the good and bad that there is to, to discover? And so we think, of course, uh, to, to, to help kids become those, you know, digital citizens, uh, we need to provide them with a strong technical foundation but also with the ability to think critically about what they do, what they see, you know, the, the why. We're French, we like to ask why, 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 why. And uh, so we think when, when kids are exposed to code and technology, we need an approach that walks on two legs. There's code and then there's the culture side. And so when we create um, learning pathways or learning sequences, we try to mix both this aspect of learning code, which can be blocks or, or JavaScript, uh, and, and also uh, the ability to think about what applications are possible uh, from technology, and also the pitfalls of technology, because it's always uh, a two-sided coin. So uh, our main um, uh, motivator, uh, like with Scratch, is creation. It's, it's always about uh, being able to uh, invest oneself in, in something, in a personal project, and, and we want kids to be more than just uh, passive consumers, of course. We want them to be able to, um, to use uh, technology to create, to communicate, and we want them to be able to think also about how they're using all this and, and how their um, actions and online presence affect their identity in this digital world. Um, I've, I've talked of learning pathways, essentially it's um, activities that can be done uh, offline, in class, so for example a teacher wants to talk about data, they'll ask you know what, what do you think that is, uh, maybe watch a video, kind of expand a bit the, the conversation, and then uh, they can also move on to um, online uh, activities, more creative, more technical. Uh, but the, the cultural component of it is really important, and, and we like to. Uh, we, we also create a lot of. We have a small audiovisual studio, so we create a lot of videos. One of them is called Citizen Code. It's something that will be shown on TV and it will be in the classrooms as well. And it's it's very short stuff. It's two minutes thirty. We have twenty of them. The topics range from. Uh, so robotics, data, and artificial intelligence, what have you. And it's for kids aged 9 to 14 mostly, but it's of course uh, applicable uh, a bit more widely. And what we do is we use uh, what we refer to as a youth magazine format. So it's both um, kind of animated video and also live action. Because when we talk about something like data, for example, which can be really abstract for a kid, it's good to define it, but then we want to connect it to the real world. So we, we always go and talk to two real persons, uh, researchers, people who work for NGOs, for companies, and, and that help kids connect this concept with actual daily life things that happen so they can make sense of it. Uh, and then we work on some co-learning apps. So one is uh, kind of a light Unity type of thing. Uh, it's just for the parallel. I don't intend to really compare it to Unity. Uh, where kids ha can manipulate uh, game objects in a scene. It's uh, like 2D, 2D games. And then they can code using blocks and uh, JavaScript to try to provide a, a scaffolding from moving on from blocks to JavaScript and to actual uh, script code, uh, and each object has its own code, so it's co uh, object-oriented also uh, programming. And another app is something where we try, it's called Data Decode, it's something where we try to provide kids with a way to interact with data, so um, exposing them to what a database is, a very simplified model, but they can create interactive stories, and, and these things are, are kind of hackable. It's like, once you get into the JavaScript part of it, you can do pretty much anything you want. And, um, well, I think I might be done with a little bit of advance. Ooh, look at this. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, we've also worked with Snap on some uh, other apps uh, for, like, uh, pixel um, drawings. And, and basically, we try to provide lots of creative entrances for kids because not everyone wants to create a video game. Not everyone wants to play uh, with music or image. And, and so as many ways as possible that we can find 
uh, we think it's useful to provide those those main ways. Uh, I'll be, I think, tomorrow from three to four um, at the poster thing. So if you want to talk, then uh, of course, uh, welcome. And uh, thank you very much. Um, so please now, all the, key, the Ignite Talk speakers can, no, 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 don't leave the stage, please. Can you join us? Because we start um, a 20 minutes uh, talk debate, and you can ask, please, questions to all the speakers. Eloise, yes, Kristin. Um, thank you very much. It's very hard to do a five minutes talk, and you did it great. Thank you very much. Uh, so now it's... Um, Uh, questions time. I've got a microphone. You've got the speakers here. So, who wants to ask the first question? Yeah, Wanda. <laughs> That's always the first question after an Ignite talk. Yes, we will be sharing the slides. <laughs> Questions for Louisa. I wonder maybe you could start a discussion in the Scratch Ed community so other teachers could share similar projects because I think your work is amazing. How could other teachers find the projects that you make? Maybe you could start a discussion in Scratch Ed. Frank, maybe you could show Scratch Ed. Okay, um, I'm writing something about, and yes, <laughs> and tomorrow, tomorrow in my poster session, I give more examples how to make showing interesting uh, projects focusing in these ideas in a workshop. I'm going to talk a little bit about neuroplasticity and have the, um, the, the opportunity of the, the attendees uh, of making scratch projects using these tools, these ideas, this approach. Tomorrow, don't lose it. <laughs> Good. Okay. Another question there? Thank you. Um, and analyzing the scratch code, uh, and this is the, the question then, and then raised to my mind is then maybe assuming then the goal of the entire community is to become good programmers. So it's a novice expert analysis. And then you apply everything that is uh, bad along this path to the entire community, maybe it's not the, the right approach, because there are part of the communities that are not interested in becoming programmers, and making some mistakes is part of the thing. So I'm not claiming that it's a bad thing, but, but if you say the percentage of everything, maybe it's not a good way of analyzing what's going on. Yeah, so the first goal of this analysis, of course, was just to understand what is there. It's not very much a, a value proposition. It's just we want to understand if these things are common or not. And it's, I agree with you that it's a very hard trade-off. The same goes for math education or language education. You want kids to learn and be creative and explore, but also you don't want them to learn bad habits because if they do program later on, then it might get harder and harder to relearn or de-learn some of the habits. So it's really very much a trade-off between, yes, some kids are only interested in building stuff and it does, quality isn't important, but on the other hand, you also want to give some feedback into quality because there are many people that will do some programming in their life, not even as professional programmers, but also small scripts or spreadsheets or websites. Hi, I'm, I'm kind of responding to your session that uh, was in a way really inspiring, but also in a way I found it very disturbing um, in that uh, you were looking at what, what do kids create, kind of the complexity and the concepts involved, but it seemed you were also having expectations about what is considered a bad habit um, that you learned elsewhere in the programming community. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, what if what is considered a bad habit really is a bad habit elsewhere in that 
professional programming community. Like the one glaring example that really got my blood boiling was when you said, you know, code smells and dead code. There is no such thing as dead code in Snap, uh, in Scratch. It's a live environment. You click on anything that's just unattached there to try something out to, and you know, other programming environments don't have that. So the question to me is, is it really something that the kids are learning a bad habit in Scratch? Or is it that everybody else is forced to use bad habits in their programming and shouldn't everything else be a little bit more like scratch? Yeah, no, it's a really interesting question. Also, because of the dupli <laughs> because duplication isn't even solvable if you have it across multiple sprites. However, regarding to the dead code, I have seen, and I'm sure some people in the audience have also seen, kids super confused because they're looking at the signal and it's supposed to send, for example, it's called a game over, and they're sure that this happens if the game is over, but the signal is never sent. I, I, so I'm just going to respond to that right away. There yes. is confusion. Sure, but here's the other thing. Scratch and, you know, kids are sharing their projects. They're also sharing their projects while they're in the making. So what you see sometimes isn't the finished thing yet. You might even be encouraged not to do something and then touch, don't touch it again. I, it's just, I don't you know, disagree. I, I think it's great to, to, to look at projects and to actually see what they're doing. And it's, it's, it's great, you know, finding concept that, the, that they're using. It's just, I'm, I'm wondering, we had this talk uh, at SAP a couple of weeks ago where they were telling us about, you know, Industry 4.0 and about what, what does it take to, to make programs in the 21st century to, that we have these live ecosystems that we can't plan ahead, that we have to change at runtime. And it occurs to me that that's exactly how kids are programming in Scratch. Like, we have to change things. We can't stop the world and then do things. So, um, it, I feel like there's a But, but that can that mean that we give them no feedback at all about how to program. Or is that what you're suggesting? No, I'm, su I'm, I'm suggesting, or my, my proposal is that Scratch has a bunch of things that are pretty unique to Scratch that aren't found in other programming environments, um, and that you're considering them to be code smells, whereas they're features. I just want to jump into the discussion because I don't, I don't completely agree. As a teacher myself, I think there are many different ways of learning. There's no two children or adults learning the same way. And I think what we learned this morning is that feedback is crucial. And there are different ways of giving feedback. And I think you can just use the feedback, just leave it aside. But the more feedback you can give, the more you can learn. And you can have feedback by collaboration. You can have feedback by tooling. I mean, in, in all sorts of learning, the best feedback is like if you have a one-to-one -one feedback from somebody who guides you. And, and the worst feedback is, OK, you're doing something wrong. Here's the, the proper solution. And so feedback has to come very, very gradual. But tooling can, can help in that. Tooling can say, OK, here's something you've solved in a certain way. But maybe there's a different way. Maybe there's a different approach that other people take that work, you take it or leave it, but we give you a hint. And I think code analysis can help doing that. Nah, that's not necessarily true. The, the first definition of code smells was given in a book called Refactoring by Martin Fowler that defines refactorings in association with code smells. So it's not your codes that word, it is your, here is a way you can improve your code. For example, with the long methods, then you could split it up. And we've done studies with kids where we found that if you give them a long method, it's harder for them to read a scratch program than if they have a smaller program. So it does impact understandability. This is, a great, this is a great conversation, guys. I really like it. I think that perhaps we're missing the point a little bit. Um, you know, to me, as a so, so I don't come from the educational world. I'm a professional software developer. I'm those ones you were talking about. You know, so we talk about code smell all the time. But for me, code smell is not. It's not about something being wrong. It's about a way to understand the nature and the quality of the code that's being written. 
And I think looking at, at, at metrics and data around what the kids are creating, for me what's amazing is you, know, you see the evolution of software development is something where we've learned things over many, many years and we say, well, we're going to do it this way and then one day we go, oh, you know what, it doesn't work so well that way. If we did this other way, it might work better. It's not wrong. We don't want to be teaching these kids and say, look, you do this, it's wrong. What we want to say is, if you do it this way, it might go better. But what I see from these statistics is that probably there's a, there's a core of kids who are figuring stuff out for themselves and going, well, you know what, I'm creating this massive script and I've learned that it doesn't work so well. So, you know, maybe, maybe I'll just make a procedure and it might make life simpler. And maybe I'll only use it once, but, but it's a learning process. So I think looking at those statistics is a way that we can get a sense of that, that sort of evolution of this kind of giant organism that exists, which is the, <laughs> the Scratch community. So, yeah, I think it's wonderful to see them. I know, uh, no, I, I mean, you, we, we need like four microphones. <laughs> and everything started with a five minute talk. <laughs> uh, uh, again, my question is for Feline and, and, and the continuation of some of the things we've just, just heard. Sorry. Um, uh, to, to try and. I'm, I'm trying to look uh, forward to where your work could be and at the same time sort of snap out of some of the complaining about it. Uh, I, I wonder about two things. The first one is uh, uh, where you think a finer analysis of the work might go. For example, it might be that some very simple program was actually the start of a really interesting one. And whether you're able to exploit the information about the history of somebody's work through it's their own work that was this simple thing, this other simple thing, and then became that other more complicated thing three months later. And the other one, with regard to the code smells, is I wonder, in your own mind, what kind of um, analysis information could be provided to children that at the same time let them know that they've got this procedure there that they aren't calling at all or that they've got this duplicated code here that could become, any, uh, that could become a procedure, etc, etc, without scaring them. Yesterday we were talking about eight years old, we don't want to scare them and for that reason we did a version of Scratch that had no lists and none of so many things that now we have and now we know that it's not scaring them. So why should we believe that code smells are going to scare away and, I don't know, torture away eight-year-olds any more than lists did? <laughs> Good, so those were two questions. The first one was about evolution, I think. So we're definitely looking at this analysis where we had was just a one day analysis. What we're doing now is tracking projects over time so we can see what type of changes kids make. And especially, indeed, sometimes they go on a path and they go back and they revert. And those are the type of things we can learn from in giving feedback. Maybe something even like a recommender system where we say, well, we sort of deduce what type of thing you're doing and all the other 100 kids that went this path later tracked back. So maybe here is something you could try instead. And if you know the repository of things kids have learned, for example, you know what type of blocks they've used in the past, you could even say, hey, here's a project that you worked on three months ago that had something similar so they can learn it in their own context. And we're, we are exploring that type of feedback right now. So we have a browser plugin that analyzes a project and gives feedback to children with in sort of a star gamified type of thing where we say, well, this script, it's only about long method at this point. Like, oh, look, you have a very long method, maybe you want to split it, and then we try to analyze, give feedback, and give a suggestion. So we're, try, we're measuring the reactions of kids in classrooms to that now. Yeah, I just want to, oh, sorry. Hey, uh, just jumping in on the, on the whole feedback thing. Uh, before doing what I do now, I worked on uh, math learning games, uh, Dragon Box, if that speaks to any of you. And uh, the thing that we found is that the gamified approach, the three stars, you let kids solve an equation, but maybe they do it in a way that's not optimal. So you tell them, okay, good, you've passed, you get one stars. If you've, if you've managed to solve it in a way that, uh, uh, that is, uh, where the equation is simplified completely, okay, good, you get two stars. And if you do that and also do it in the minimum 
possible number of steps. If your logic is as efficient as possible, then you get the three stars. And what's really important is that the, the feedback is not punishing, but it's there, it's immediate, and it lets you know what you can do better. And, and I think it's something that can probably apply as well to the topic you're discussing. All right, sorry. Yeah, I also wanted, wanted to jump in because this topic is too exciting. I'm sorry about it, but <laughs> I'm very happy we're having this conversation. Yes. And I'm hearing what I'm hearing from different perspective and point of view is that it feels to me that uh, the goal of using Scratch in an activity can be very different. You know, the, the, the goal that I am excited about Scratch is that you have the possibility to experiment. You know, Rigoros was to, we're talking about this exploration. And I don't care if my code is efficient, I don't care if my code is, you know, it's the best engineered code. Because when I do an activity with Scratch, I really hope that kids, uh, you know, like get to think creatively and they get to the creative. Uh, confidence where we were talking about and I don't jump in as a facilitator saying you know what you you probably should uh, use a procedure here or maybe a loop it's more efficient than than this other thing but other people are probably uh, more interested in, in using scratch as a tool for uh, for teaching engineering or, or, or to go in, in that direction for me that's not so that, that it's kind of not, it's not what excites me, and it's not what I would consider the spirit coming from the from a lifelong kindergarten. When I see a kid working with a Lego, and I don't go in there and say, "You oh, maybe the, the 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 bridge should be built in this other way because it's more robust," you know, this kind of thing. I just want people to experiment to and to and to see how it goes, and, and, and until they get to the problem in which what they do is not kind of that doesn't work the way they, they're trying uh, so yeah like for, for me the question is w w what do you think it's uh, the, the goal you know what, what do you think it's uh, the spirit that, that, that we want to in, in which we want to use scratch <laughs> okay <laughs> um. And actually, I think to a certain extent, so I'm all about creativity. Let me remind you again that at 3 p.m. I have a workshop about creating comic books with Scratch. But at one point, messy code is standing in the way of creativity. Because if everything, if you have this long list of blocks and you want to change something, it gets harder to change something. If you have procedures, you might be able to build more interesting structures. So for me, creativity and code quality are not orthogonal. They're, creativity is sometimes helped, like you talk about Lego blocks, maybe some people like to sort their Lego blocks first because then they, it's easier for them to create something. And, and other people don't need it, that's fine, but it can help creativity. It, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. Okay. Um. Okay. <laughs> I, I, give you, I give you 30 seconds and yeah. 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is actually a fairly quick question. I don't want to talk about whether or not code smells are bad or good, because there's arguments that can be had for infinite time. My question is, when you look at code smells, you can see that a lot of professional languages are designed to you know, help programmers avoid or you know, practice certain paradigms, right? So like Ruby is pretty specific about like certain things that it tries to get you in the influence. CoffeeScript does this very heavily with JavaScript. I'm curious to know if you've looked at whether or not there are certain designs of Scratch or Snap that you know, encourage some of these practices and if their recommendations, you know, as many of us are building extensions on top of Snap for very specific te teaching purposes that we should do you know, within our designs to either encourage or discourage specific practices around code smells. Because I think that's a really specific application of you know, what we want students to do. Okay. <laughs> Uh, remember that you have the breaks. Uh, you, I mean, you can continue talking, uh, having a coffee, having lunch. Uh. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Some people have the perspective that code smells that are common in a language actually are weaknesses in that language and or that there are patterns waiting to be born or language concepts waiting to be born. So for some code smells, you could wonder, could we design entirely new concepts? So I can think of fixes, like for the signals, for the missing signals, you could have some source code analysis that what, we, be careful, there's a mismatch, but maybe the environment should be more collaborative, saying, hey, you you're, you're just deleted the last reference to that signal that's still being listened. And in some cases, Scratch does this, because you can delete a block if there's still a call, but you can delete a signal if there's still a call. So I can think of things that are band-aids, but it might be more interesting to more deeply analyze co these code smells or this data set from the perspective of new features and battle this with an entirely different me method, this example with a different methods of communication rather than zombieing everything and then you get this big monster. So it's an interesting question. I don't have an answer, but it, there's definitely something there with this data analysis that you could use not for feedback to the kids, but for feedback to the language creators. And again, our data set is on GitHub, so feel free to come up with other things yourself. I just want to go back to Christiane, and I want to say that all big companies have programs to teach children how to code, but what you described seems a little more creative and a little more in the spirit of what we're trying to do, and I wanted to ask you how that happened and what all of us can do to encourage the large corporations to create the programs that are a little more creative or interesting, like you're doing. I think um, it's nice that you think that this is going more in the creative direction because this is, this is the intent. Um, I think Jens plays a big role in that with Snap because when I first met him and I got to know Snap and I'm a design thinker, so my attitude is I'm not a computer scientist, I'm coming from more the creative uh, side of the house and I think this was a perfect match and this is still I think we can combine these two worlds so perfectly. Ba basically, there are no two worlds. This is one world. It's always the same mindset and the things which are important, um, like sharing. This is very specific and it's the first time I have, I'm lucky to attend this conference. This is about sharing, partnering, building on ideas of other people and make it more beautiful. I always like to say you multiply knowledge by sharing it. It's not competition. It, it is a bit of competition, but... Um, and I think we have a big, like, corporate point of view. We have a big network. And um, what are the people we like to work with in the future? This is one very driving factor of sharing what we have very early to give young people the opportunity to find their own talent, to learn with a connect to real world. And um, I think this will help the world if employees, future employees, bring the right Mindset. I think that's very, very relevant. This is why we do that. So thank you. Thank you very much. We're out of time. Thank you for joining the first Ignite Talk session. More Ignite Talks at three, same room. Thank you very much. And, and yes, again, we will share the slides somewhere. <laughs> <laughs>